And then like, you know, like I was telling you, this is all, um, I'm recording a lot of this stuff, trying to record a lot of stuff for a future, future podcast that I'm working on since my YouTube videos and a lot of the other stuff is getting censored and on Facebook. Um, mm-hmm. That's one of the reasons why I started writing, um, you know, trying to get back into more writing books because it's hard for them to censor that. You know, they, they can, they can burn them, but there's really not a whole lot yeah. that they can do from stopping that getting out there. And my uh, the podcast platform that I've been going through, like I haven't had any issues, no issues. I've 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 literally uh, got all of Trump's speeches, not all of them, but most of them. Um, a lot of the whole voter voter fraud stuff, I've been putting that on there, and haven't had any issues with it. So I think just for my own sanity, the whole podcasting thing seems to be working better than. Um, the YouTube and then it gets a strike and then it gets shut down and I've had I had I started a voter fraud channel I had 21 videos up there about seven of them got taken down within a week really (laughs) and they're just just people talking that's all it is it's not my my commentary so I don't know maybe if that's the whole problem that I have to add my commentary and then like you know show clips maybe that'll help with it, I don't. I really don't know, man. But I'm just. Uh, I don't know. Well, you got you got you you got you got your hands in a lot of different projects that are you know not, you know not a, not not favorites of a few people. You know, I mean, yeah. we're you know lots of different projects. Right. And so they they you know they all they probably they will probably link together anyway somewhere down the line or whatever. But you know you just you you know you're bucking you're bucking you know Big Brother you know in the. In the <laughs> The court, the court of public opinion is it's, it's opinions. Opinions yeah. aren't facts. Right. You know. Right. It's, it's like this didn't this didn't happen. You know. Well, that's the whole thing with uh, Kyle Rittenhouse is that they tried to make it like it was a fact that this yeah. guy, you know, walked up to these people and started shooting them. That's the whole. When I first heard about this case, that's what I thought happened. I thought he was, you know, some crazy nut and he just walking around during this this protest this BLM protest and start shooting people. And when I looked at the actual video, I was like, wait a minute, this guy was being chased. They were, they were going after him. I don't know how he found himself by himself when he was with there with multiple people. Um, 17 year old kid going out to a different state, crossing state lines just to, to help, you know, to help protect the local businesses from the looters and that's what the cops should should be doing the cops should be out there doing that but i don't know how we got into this spot where we're talking about you know the protest protesting violent protesting burning things down that's fine but if you protect yourself if you defend yourself from somebody coming after you all of a sudden you're a racist killer that's kind of some of the weird things that that we've had here. So um, we're going to be talking with Stephen Sanziri, author of the Ultimate Prey. Ultimate Prey can be found on uh, pretty much everywhere, right, Stephen? I can go to Amazon right now and probably find it. Ultimate Prey, Amazon. Anybody can just purchase that right now. Ultimate Prey, the true story behind the Yosemite Sightseer murders. This was written, or this was published, paperback published on July 28, 2012. And it, it is a excellent book, an excellent book, Stephen. Um, I have never really, I don't know how much we've, I, I know when, we, when I first had you on, we kind of talked about this. How long did it take you to write this book? Oh, Greg, hey, thanks for having me on again. Great, great Got speaking it. with you. Um, it took about 10 years. Wow, that's a long time. That's pretty much what, how yeah. long it took me to write my first book and um, going through all of the motions. How many drafts would you say this book went through? You know what? Uh, it started off as a, a, a 600-page manuscript, uh, single-spaced, okay? So <laughs> I didn't know what I, I – I didn't know – oh, yeah, I was flying. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, it, was a, it was a combination of the Yosemite murder case and – uh, uh, my my like seven short stories of my bounty hunt, hunting career when I was chasing bad guys as a bail agent, and there were seven of them that were just you know unbelievable stories. So I kind of combined it, and uh, I sent the manuscript off to Molly 
I'm sorry, not Molly Giles, um, Maureen Adelstein in um, New York, and she was a big uh, editor and such, and she took it and cut it in half, and she liked the bounty hunting book better than the Yosemite book originally, too. And yeah. so, um, yeah, it was very interesting, and I, I just said, no, i got to write the Yosemite book, which I'm happy I did, but that's kind of, kind of how it started. And I had some pretty good eyes on it. Uh, Bruce Porter, who wrote Blow uh, with Johnny Depp in the book, he, he got to see my manuscript. Wow. Uh, also, so I got some pretty good kudos early on. Oh, that's great! I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. that must have been a big, a big boost to kind of show you that you're on the right path, right? Well, I didn't tell you the other big, 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 uh, big uh, kudos was uh, I was in Mexico when I was when I was a PI in San Diego, where I am, where I am now today. Matter of fact, in 2002, when I started writing the book, and I went down to Rosarita to Mexico. And uh, they were shooting uh, Tremors, a television show, and I was down there with the with friends of mine. I worked on the set, and they had the same guys in it, and everything. And um, Molly Giles, uh, uh, who's a famous uh, um, re- teacher, really in San Francisco State, she was Amy Amy Tam's uh, teacher at San Francisco uh, City College, and she also edited Amy Tam's book, and it which became the Joy Luck Club. And so she, she, yeah, she happened to be down there. I left my manuscript because a friend of mine said, leave it. She's coming down here. And I never met her. And I got a note later on. She loved it. And she was a Pulitzer Prize nominee for short stories. And, and, I, and she told me uh, some things to do and everything. And it was really amazing. So I also got that, that those kudos. So That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah, I, did, I didn't realize you were able to cut it down from 600 pages. So there's a lost 400 pages out there somewhere. Huh? Well, that's, enough, that's that's ready to go in the second book. It's already nice. been ready, ready to go. So yeah. Awesome. What's what's the status on on that one? Still in draft form? Still working it out? Or? No, you know, it's just it's just getting an editor. Pretty yeah. much, it's pretty much done. You know, finding somebody who'll keep your voice. Right. Yeah. Good luck. Um, yeah, man, yeah. I'll be, I'll be cheering, cheering you on for that yeah. now. The way the whole censorship and everything is is getting. Um, but it's good for for these stories because a lot of these stories, if if you don't write a book on it, you know, if you don't stay on it, if we don't keep talking about it, uh, it's going to go down the memory hole, and that's something that we definitely don't want. So um, while well, we're coming up on about uh, ten years, then that this book has been been out and I, I hope people will definitely take the time to actually read it um i think if you just read the, the first couple chapters you'll pretty much be hooked on it and trying to figure out okay all these different people and all this different stuff but um it's a very fascinating case and a, and a different definitely a different take on this on this story uh this national story that that we've heard um, just reading here from some of it, Stephen Sanziri, former police officer, private investigator, and bounty hunter, that's why we've called him here today, uh, has investigated these tragic deaths for the Site City, Site Seer murders, the Yosemite Site Seer murders. Uh, what, he, what he found includes drug trafficking, child porn, white supremacy, child molestation, rape, and bloody violence in the Central Valley of California and stretching to the foothills. That's tough. That's pretty much, um, I mean, that would pretty much wrap up a lot of the issues that we are seeing here. And um, uh, those are some very dark, very deep topics that not everybody would be comfortable with. But I think that the book is written in such a way that it just kind of keeps you, you know, it, it is a page turner. It just keeps you just wanting to know more and know more and know more about what is happening here. So, um, in the first hand uh, count, obviously, you can never, <laughs> never go wrong with that. So, I won't spoil it too much, but I, I do hope that everybody listening to this will take the time to read that book by Stephen Sanziri, The Ultimate Prey, or actually just Ultimate Prey, the story behind. The true story behind the Yosemite Sightseer murders. All right, great work on that. It's 224 pages and definitely worth every penny. $9.99, $9.89. Wow. It's on sale right now, so go ahead and get that. <laughs> and have prime, well, Greg, thank you. That's gr- thank you so much. <laughs> got it. Yeah, that's great, man. 
I really love it. So <laughs> because you're a bondsman, um, I, I thought, and we were talking about this, I think you made a comment um, on Facebook, and it was like a light switch went off. Oh, yeah, Stephen Sanziri has done bonds work. He would understand this issue that I'm having with the Kyle Rittenhouse bond hearing, the latest bond hearing, because they made it seem like Kyle Rittenhouse jumped bail. They couldn't find him. He was hiding. He's going to go. He's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. So he's running. They don't know where he is. He fired his lawyers. Uh, it, it just all these crazy stories. So what I did and what I recommend everybody do is there's a 50-minute video that you can watch of the Kyle Rittenhouse bond hearing, the most recent one, dated February 11, 2021. Watch that and then go and listen, watch what everybody else is saying, because it's like two completely different worlds. You would think we're in a parallel world or something like that when I watch this hearing. And that's been the case with everything involving this young kid, Kyle uh, Rittenhouse. Now, he's 17 years old. 17 years old, he has been uh, accused of murder uh, if you read the first bond court document, and I'm going to pull that up here. By the way, you can find all of this on my website. Go to what is truth uh, 911. What is truth 911, and look for Kyle Rittenhouse. And I've got all the documents. As there's more documents, as we get more documents, I will make sure to add those documents here to this. Uh, this will also be a part of one of my next books too. This will be the final chapter of that one. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But in this bond hearing, or in the very first bond court document, non-traffic complaint and notice to appear. This is by the Antioch police. Um, let's see. And the first thing that was weird, right from the very start, this was this became public, and anyone that is looking at this can see that they have not only do they have Kyle Rittenhouse's name and everything, they tell you where he lives from the very start. This is dated eight twenty six twenty. Since that date, anybody who wanted to hurt this kid, seventeen year old kid, uh, could go and find out where he lived and could do something very bad to him. Uh, this is very relevant. I'm just going to read a little bit. Uh, the fu he was a fugitive of justice is what they said. And if you see the actual video, you can see Kyle Rittenhouse tried to give himself up to the cops. The cops didn't pay any uh, attention to, to him. They had spoken with him that whole day. They knew exactly who this kid was. Uh, news media knew who this kid was because he's walking around with a loaded firearm talking about that there he's just basically there to make sure there isn't any trouble if people aren't burning down buildings protecting local businesses that's what Kyle Rittenhouse was doing in uh, Kenosha so Kenosha Wisconsin is where all of this happened um, Kyle Rittenhouse lives in Illinois so um, not only do they give you in this first bond this bond court document and they let you know everything about him I'm surprised they don't give you his social security number but they tell you exactly where he lives and they said that he uh, after having been charged in Kenosha the state of Wisconsin with the offense of first degree intentional homicide he was in violation of the Wisconsin statute copy of, of such charge they give you the warrant number and um, they pretty much said that he fled the state of Wisconsin and once again the video evidence proves that he did not flee anything <laughs> so I want to be very clear on that so that's how this whole thing started the bond court Kyle Rittenhouse told to show up uh, goes through a lot of other things that happened but what happened on February 11th is that Kyle Rittenhouse they said that he uh, jumped bail basically and um, we know that that's not true so we're going to read a little bit about this for Judge Schroeder. No relation to Ricky Schroeder as far as we know. But interesting <laughs> fact about Ricky Schroeder, Ricky Schroeder is one of the first people that helped Kyle Rittenhouse post bond. So oh, well, wow. <laughs> so, interesting. Yeah, I thought that was pretty fascinating too. Um, so at this hearing, this Zoom call, it's a 50-minute call. Stephen, have you, have you had a chance to watch that 50-minute call? There's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Um, 
one of the victims that was shot is actually on this call and has been on mm-hmm. several other calls. And one of right. the fathers of um, one of the people who was shot and killed is also in this call. And right. uh, so it's pretty yeah. interesting. It's uh, especially towards the the end here, but. Um, oh, I saw. Yeah, I, I watched it about one one and three quarters times through, and, and I definitely got it. And I I see both sides of it, and I, of course I'll give you my opinion on on both sides. Yeah, I mean, I I want to know what did Kyle Rittenhouse do wrong, right? So that's the whole thing here. Did he did he jump bail? Is he running from the cops? Because that's the way that all of these news re- reports made it sound like that he was running. If you well, watch this hearing, what do you, what do you think? Well, well. First, first off, I've been in situations like this with defendants, um, not with that, that they were murder suspects and we're hiding them out and all that. <clears throat> but in a situation like this, I guarantee you, his attorney or attorneys uh, are protecting him, and it doesn't matter what they have to do; they're gonna they're gonna keep him alive. And there's people that do want to kill Kyle. I mean, that's a fact. So they're gonna hide him out, and whatever little slap on the wrist they get as a sanction, as, as counsel for Kyle Rittenhouse, is definitely worth it to keep him alive. That, that, that's the main thing. That's what the judge, you know, you know the final, the final uh, decision by the judge was to, you know, keep his address to three different agencies, including the judge, the sheriff's department, and the, the clerk of the court, and, and the DA didn't even, it wasn't even allowed to have it. it, it nope, this, this, there's, a, there's moles everywhere, <laughs> that's right. you know? Yeah, and I don't I don't fault this this judge for that either. I mean, I don't, no. it's a special circumstance. This lawyer, we're going to talk a lot a bit about this lawyer, or I'm sorry, the DA, the lawyer representing the DA, um, a Mr. Binger. I never did get his first name. I'll have to look that. I'm sure I could look that up and find it. But this is the guy who's basically saying they want to raise Kyle Rittenhouse's bond by two hundred thousand. And they want the court to issue a, a warrant for Chris. For, I keep saying Chris Kyle. Kyle Rittenhouse. They wanted to issue a warrant for Kyle Rittenhouse. Is is that necessary in this situation? Um, I mean, if a guy makes all of his court, he shows up for every every time that he's called to court. Kyle Rittenhouse shows up. Uh, he's never violated any of the bond or anything like that the the reason they want to raise his bond to 200,000 is because he put a PO box down for where he lives for where he he lived and because um he actually in one record he signed his name and put that he lived at the previous address so this kind of it kind of gets into this weird thing I was really trying to figure out okay what are they doing? Is this justified? Is this just punishment, or is this just the the DA? Do they realize? <laughs> does the Kenosha County DA do they realize that they really messed up by even charging Kyle Rittenhouse, and now they have to find something? It kind of looks like they're digging. Uh, well, you know what? Okay, they, they, it's, okay. Somebody dies. Somebody's getting charged. That's that's in any, that's anywhere. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, so there's that there's there's people have that were, were killed sadly because of this. So, but and he, he, you know, and he, he, he pulled the trigger. Okay. Just with that being said, the, the, what he originally, he bailed out for $2 million. And it, so it sounds like it was a cash bond with the court because you have, you have surety bail, you have property bail and you have cash bail. There's the three kinds of bonds, three types of bonds everywhere, including Wisconsin. So he posed, it was the cash that was raised, not property, I believe. And a cash bail uh, is no collateral, so the court will keep a. It's considered court bond or bail. And so, as far as him keeping staying alive and everything, that's one thing. What to go ahead and ask for ten percent more in cash for two hundred thousand dollars is the DA saying now we're going to have conditions because there's a new bond. They can have now put conditions in to say we do know and want to know where he lives. That's the the back door of what they were going to do. The judge saw that, and that's the reason they're, buy, they're buying that address. They want that information because if something happens, the DA is an elected position. He does not have control of this case. Are you kidding me? This is, uh, this is, this, his ego is terribly broken. I mean, he's the district attorney. He can't control this. 
that judge made the right decision to keep that out of the uh, hands of anybody. It's an un, it's a need to know basis. Can you explain the bond process? How does that relate to a warrant? Does the bond and the warrant do they go hand in hand? How does this process work? If, yeah, if, the, if the court revokes your bond, they issue a warrant in place of it, and that's basically what they do. So, in other words, in other words, when you're out on a surety bond, like when I was a bail bondsman, we post, and it's basically an insurance policy. Okay, we're guaranteeing the court that our client is going to show up to your courthouse on X, you know, date and time. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't, then you issue a warrant, okay, and the bond is revoked at that time, basically. Now, we can go in and say, well, we'll keep him on a bond or what have you. So as soon as the bond is revoked, and the the thing is, is that, you know, would would they be revoking the bond and making the bond now, uh, you know, two, two. $2.2 $2.2 million, or, or would it be, they're going to make them post a second bond as punishment. Uh, you know, yeah, they, it looks like punishment. And the, the DA's bullying this case, mm-hmm. but that's so, they want this information. The DA knows that, and they'll be, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, um, conditions on, on the new bond, and one will be giving up address. Because on a regular surety bond, Greg, when we had people out on bond, if they moved, we could surrender them without a warrant uh, for due cause of not telling us their address. But we didn't do it. You know, it, it, we had collateral and such. And the court has $2 million bucks. And where's this kid going to go? You know, everybody knows his face, you know? Yeah, and that's, that's the big thing is that, oh, well, he didn't tell us where he, he sure. actually moved to, et cetera, et cetera. We want more than a P.O. box. Um, which, you know, if he signed right. a document and, um, and he put where he lived, uh, he put his, where he used to live, I think that's the big issue. That's where the DA's office kind of felt like they were justified, well, because he doesn't live here at this address, but he signed it to make it seem like he did. And so they have a pretty good point there, right? I mean, if you sign a document, you need sure. to put where where you actually live, or even that some PO box or something, right? You cannot well, put it in a place that you don't he, live at. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's say that maybe that's something they put in there. Maybe he knew he had to be protected. It's his first move. That doesn't give the DA cause to say, "Oh, now you got to tell us where you live," because he's more he's more exposed every day. It's on the internet. There's more people that want to kill him. I mean, it's not going to go. Away. It's not going away. So now all of a sudden, because you lied to us in the beginning, maybe or, or just as what you did, you know. And the thing you got to remember, the kid was 17. He had he couldn't sign anything without counsel or his parents there. Okay. Mm-hmm. So who now? Let's look now. Who are we going to blame now? Not the kid. You can't sign a contract as a kid. Okay. You you got your rights. Your your rights are different. You have to have representation. You can't you can't waive your rights in Miranda. So you know this. So take that away. You know who's the blame? Well, the, the, you know attorneys are funny guys. They're pretty much exempt from perjury. And you know, like I said, if that's my client. Let's let's we get this thing figured out. And it looks like the last representation didn't do him well. And I, I don't want we'll to talk about that. I'm not sure why they I guess they fired him uh, for Richards. It could be uh, over, uh, over this. This could be why um, why he got fired. Maybe because he told him to. Uh, you know, put where, wherever he used to live. Uh, maybe I, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. We really don't know why, but the 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 timing is right around yeah. the same same time when um, when the court wants to increase his his bond and put out a warrant for him, which it just seems like a waste of of the court's time. Oh sure. You know, so. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous. So it's just, you know, yeah, like you said, the DA's digging on this. The DA's elected. It's the biggest case in, in, in Wisconsin in Kenosha's history. And you know what? Now there's a DA who has no control over some, of some information. That's, 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 you know, that's the way it is. That's definitely, you know, a bone of contention. That doesn't, you know, it's not a good pill to swallow for that DA. But I see the judge's point. I mean, this, this in, in the in the law says is that the, the court can overrule this in bail law, if it's a special needs circumstances or you know witnesses or whatever have to be protected. 
the judge can overrule that. That there's no argument in that, and that's why the judge got what he got because he, he judge can that even says it in the law. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's, a, it's like disclosing snitches, uh, and yeah, and I've seen that and been involved in that. And let me tell you, I mean, it puts you on the SHIT list for a long time with law enforcement. It really does. But you know, that's just they didn't play by the rules, and you expose it. And the judge says, "I'll I'll hear it," and he and he makes a move on it, and. This is what happened. This judge was he was a hero. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he, sure. He, he might have saved this kid's life. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. The DA doesn't care. You know, I mean, they, they really don't. And you know what? It's, he, he, the thing is, the DA might be a good guy. You could trust him. But not, not everybody in that office you can't. And people get bribes and payoffs. This is, I mean, look what they do paparazzi does for, you know, half-naked picture of a celebrity. I mean, you know, it, it, big money in this stuff. And there's big money in this, too. You know, and, and did Kyle know something? You made you made a good point. He was left alone at one time. You know. Yeah. How does how does that happen? He was there with the with the group of people all day long. In this video, uh, he's by himself. How does he end up by himself? And how do people know that? And why do they choose at that point to go after him? Very very key thing. I kind of think he was probably probably set up. Is what it actually looks like here. Um, I think it's. I think it's. There's. It's a. It's very, very deep, and I'm not exactly sure yet. And because a lot of the stuff hasn't come out, I'm hoping this court case will bring a lot of that data out so that everybody can see that data. I, I'm. My biggest fear is that by that time, a lot of people are just going to be like, "Oh, he's just guilty. He's just a crazy, crazy kid." Oh well, well you know. Uh, know uh, yeah. Here's. Here's. You know, if I was investigating this case right now. I'd be looking back, back at social media and the recruitment with Antifa and BLM and the left and the right, and there's a lot of moles on both sides, as we know, Republicans that are really Democrats. And, um, they, they, you know, there's this young kid, man. He knows how to handle this weapon, obviously. I mean, you know, and he's, you know he's, he's a chubby little white kid. If it was a black guy, I mean, no, I mean, I'm not trying to play the race card. But this is, you know, cops, this, kid, this white kid walked past law enforcement with his hands up, when after the shooting, but they were bringing when they're bringing in the A team with the with the uh, um, SWAT and stuff like that. You know they're not going to stop for this kid, but the patrol unit behind uh, them that stopped the, the cruiser on the side took care of him. And, but they knew that this kid was no threat. Had his hands up, all that kind of stuff. The thing is, is that it, you know he went in there and did what he did. These cops showed up afterwards. You know nobody was patrolling the streets and doing all that. They were waiting for things like this, and it was going to happen. Right. And I think that maybe this kid got recruited, okay, like a lot of the other kids, and got recruited to this, you know, you know, protest or whatever. We need kids to protect buildings. We, or we need armed, armed patriots to protect buildings. You know, we don't care how old you are on some website platform. Look at social media is what I look at. How did he get there? How did he be word of mouth? He didn't live there, you know, and he's come to Army. He comes as first aid kid. He was prepared, obviously. Was it just a friend who was there? He knew that, that he shoots guns too. I don't know. Right, right. Yeah, he does talk about that too, and I, I think you're right. I think he saw um, a, a post on Facebook and basically mm-hmm. felt that he was going to go there um, and he was going to help. You know, he, he was going to help these people because there was nobody sure. else that was that was doing it. And it, I mean, it, this was happening everywhere, especially at at that oh. time. They were boarding sure. up. Sure. You know, places that had nothing to do oh, with this. It's oh, you know what? Listen, I, I, I understand this kid as, as a former law enforcement officer and such, is that when all this started, I mean, not started, let's say for the last six months uh, and a little bit prior, I was, I was organizing law enforcement officers prior, law enforcement military guys with certain statuses, but is it really and organize it and basically re- regionally in the United States and start the big cities and go on down and, and make, you know, get your groups together, have your places and, you know, to protect, protect neighborhoods. Cause not everybody has guns. And, and you know, this is the same thing was to prepare. And, and there's a lot of guys that wanted to sign on. I understand the same thing. And, and we, we were talking about grouping up and, and it was a serious issue. And it still is maybe, you know, and this was, this kid was, you know, that somebody got, got to him and it was, he wasn't the only one. Right. Right. And we're not hearing anything about the other people um, that were there. You know, it's everything has pretty much gone quiet. Um, all about this this case, sure. except for except for when this came back up, 
it just, you know, kind of reinvigorated the whole thing that this is just some crazy, crazy kid who did, did something bad, blah, blah, blah. And it's just, it's just crazy. Um, we're definitely going <laughs> to try to stay on top of this case. I need to find out when the next hearing is, too. Um, I think it's this, I think the real, tri I think the trial is scheduled for this summer. So I could be wrong on that, but I'm um, definitely going to find out. Um, it got so bad that after this case happened, um, President Trump, they actually asked him, you know, they, they wanted a couple quotes from Trump, and Trump pretty much backed this, this kid up, too. And uh, they were trying to make it seem like this was all about guns, you know, this this was all about, well, this is why kids mm -hmm. shouldn't, shouldn't have guns. And uh, Trump sure. did, you know, go in and pretty much um, give a pretty rational explanation about this, and, you know, we can't just say that he was guilty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of different stuff, but that's why I pretty much made sure that, I've ha that I have these documents here. So if anybody does want to just read these, the actual documents, look at the quotes, look at what these people say, because um, you're not really going to get that. If you just Google this, this case, it's all going to be the same thing. In fact, I'm going to actually do that right now while we're here. If it's just Google, Kyle, and I hate using that word because I use DuckDuckGo, but whatever. Um <laughs> Kyle Rittenhouse, trial of a teenager delayed until November. Wow, that's a long time. Okay, that's the 2022. Gee, that's a really long time. Kyle Rittenhouse trial delayed at least seven months. Okay, trial of fascist Kenosha shooter. So now he's a fascist Kenosha shooter delayed until November. And it's all of this Kenosha unrest shooting. What really happened? Kyle Rittenhouse. Here's here's how the case unfolded by CNN. Yeah, right. Like I'm gonna trust those bastards to really tell me how the case really unfolded. No, thank you. No, thank you. I'll I'll do my own my own research on that. But um, I, I guess he's supposed to be this crazy killer. Uh, he's a KKK. He, and so it, so is Trump, so they wanted to tie him with Trump at that time. I mean, just totally ridiculous stuff anyways. Well, you, you know, okay, you, you remember that movie, great movie, Red Dawn? Yes. Okay, and, and you know, it, and the Russians were involved, and the Cubans, and they came, and they took over our, 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 our land and everything, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a great story, and what, how, how they fought back, you know, the kids fought back. And they were heroes, you know. I mean, this kid, you know, whatever his mindset was, I mean, you know, um, and, you know, I'm just sure, I'm sure, I'd love to see the psych, psychology and the test on him because he's not going to be whacked out like a lot of people think he is. He's going to be a kid that just, you know, if it was a war and he could get in, he probably would have joined the Marine Corps, you know. Right. And, but he, did, he, didn't, he didn't enter that, that battle zone that, that night at 11.45 p.m., to go ahead and kill people, you know, he wasn't, he went in there at, just to go in there, and then he ended up, he had to, he had to defend himself, and, and then take some lives, and that just happened, it would happen, um, and, and, you know, if he didn't have a weapon, he'd be dead. That's true, very, very you know? true, great point there. Yep, and even, even, um, even with that, that gun, you know, he, uh, did not fire until until people tried to grab his gun. And if you read the actual documents, the court documents here, uh, I believe it's by Kenosha, by the Kenosha County, I believe. Uh, in their own documents, if you just read the, just this one document here, uh, read, here are the char here are the charges against Kyle Rittenhouse. So if you just read that, it's five pages. Um, yeah, by the state of Wisconsin against Kyle Rittenhouse, pretty much tells you ev everything right there. Um, how the gun, how two of three people reached for for his gun. The third guy who got shot, who didn't get killed, um, pulled out his own gun and tried to shoot Kyle Rittenhouse. And Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, if you look at it too, he he only fired. He only hit each person once. Let's put it like that. So it's not like they got he he busted a bunch of rounds into all of these people. He shot at them one time, one hit, one shot well, for each of these three people. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, if you look if you look at the self defense, you know, outline. It's two grabbed, two of them grabbed his gun, mm -hmm. one assaulted him, mm -hmm. 
and uh, the other one was um, was the guy pointed the gun at him. So he, he had two two that uh, tried to grab his gun. One tried to hit him with a skateboard. And the other guy was pointing a, a, a automatic, small automatic weapon at him. So they, there's 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 just four four shots. Yeah, and and there uh, were there were dozens of other people chasing him too. Sure, yeah. so, you know that if so if, you, if you line up to grab the gun and these others right there are these points right here. There's so uh, justified for self-defense. Right, right. So uh, so that's why I was like, well, why are they even charging him then? It has to be more than just about Kyle, about this kid. It can't just be, oh, because we want to get to the facts, to the truth. And then all of a sudden, right from the very start, they're trying to tie it, tie him to Trump, trying to tie him to this alt-right, trying to tie him to patriots, trying to tie him to people who really love this country, who care about cops, who care about our soldiers, who care about our streets that don't want to see... These small businesses get ruined. Their lives are ruined. I've watched thousands of actual videos of these people saying, my, they've destroyed my business. You have people that are begging BLM, please do not attack my business. They have signs out there, and the cops are doing nothing. Nobody's doing anything. But a guy like Kyle is the bad guy. Now, you were um, – I don't know where you lived during that time, but you remember the riots, the, the, the Rodney King riots, and mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of people uh, with, shot, with shotguns, with uh, rifles on top of their right. buildings that sure. were pr pr protecting their, their stores. Uh -huh. Sure. That's not that, – that's what, Well, that's what I was going to say. If, you know, take part of the narrative away that, that Kyle entered another state with a weapon. It's like if he's going in there to hunt, you know, he's going out of state to hunt deer or something. You know, I mean, ridiculous. If he was a resident of that state and lived in that neighborhood and his father owned that laundry mat that was getting burned, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be talking about this right now, maybe. Right, right. But because That's how I, I mean, and it, it's such a, I mean, that should make no difference, in what, you know, what, what he did or the cause of what he did for self-defense. Because it would have been the same situation if he lived there protecting his dad's laundry. Because that's the one kid in Koreatown during the Watts rights. He's a, he's a, he's, a, he's a congressman now, and they got him on a roof at age 14 with with a weapon, protecting Koreatown. And he's he's a total advocate. He said if they didn't have if they weren't on they, they didn't have to shoot anybody. I think maybe his brother did, but if they didn't have that, they, they would have lost everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, he, and he's a Cal, and he's a representative I think out of like like Southern California now. Oh wow! Yeah. I didn't. I didn't know that. That's yeah, he got a picture when he's 14 years old up on the roof, and now he's a he's a congressman. Yeah, <laughs> kind of neat. That's pretty interesting. I'll have to look him mm -hmm. up. Um, yeah, I forgot his name. But Kyle Kyle Rittenhouse was um, charged with six six different counts here, um, and it's just. It's just so stupid. I mean, I don't think any of these counts are, are really gonna gonna stick. So I do think that there are people out there that want to make sure that he doesn't show up for for trial. Now they have until next year to find out where this kid lives. And uh, that I really, you know, I mean, I want to get this case over with. If I'm Kyle Rittenhouse, I want to get oh, yeah. it over with. You know, I don't want all of, all of that because even after that. He's still going to always have to worry, you know, he's still going to have to look at that. And a case like this is going to be a warning for anybody else who might want to oh, sure. help out other, sure. other people. They're going to well, think it, well, you know, for, first off, I don't think this case should take that, that a year out. It's ridiculous, ridiculous, uh, even on this case. You know, you got you have video now. I mean, was, what, what are people going to say that they didn't see this? I mean, you know, the, the, the evidence is overwhelming in a lot of ways on this here. He surrendered. He didn't run away. You know, he didn't, you know that kind of stuff. But the other thing is, is that, um, you know, they, the, the long, there's going to be there'll be some legislation in between and some things that are going to pass, they hope, with firearms or let's think, you know, let's think the NRA sub or whatever it's going to be. And that, so anything that, that they, they can get can slip in here, can change, laws are changed. And they can go ahead and file. They got like that. It's like a, it's, got, it's called nook tax something. It's a, it's a motion to go back that, oh, because this law wasn't there, but we can act like it was now. There's, there's motions like that they can pull. Uh, so that the, a year, a lot of things can happen in a year to change laws and stuff that, that you know, probably aren't going to help him if, if, they're, if they're trying to change them. Right.
Right. You know, and that's what I see like that, that, that kind of stuff happening. And plus who else, what else, what else is going to happen now? If, you know, with, on the, on the, on the pl- political platform, all of a sudden Biden is, you know, he's not coming out of his basement anymore or whatever. Now Kamala's running the country. I mean, who, you know, wow. Oh, you know, what's that going to do to this case? I mean, this is the only thing they have right now besides Chauvin and Floyd right now, really, really, it's, that are that big right now on the, in, in the court of public opinion on what happened or what have you. These are two things, the major things that turned a lot of what's going on, and they got them both right now going on. And so, you know, they're not going to run them both at the same time. You know, there's no way they would do that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So they're running Floyd Chauvin right now, and this is going to follow. So this buys them time, and, you know, and I'm sure that the, I'm sure the black robes up top have had to go that far would agree. So that's why I see this. It's, you know, they can't throw both of these at, you know. And that's why it's been pretty quiet on the home front, too, with the riots and stuff. You know, this see what happens with all this, you know. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely has. I mean, there are still some riots and things like that going on, but they're not being covered now. Because they don't, right. you know, because they they know that they were trying to subconsciously tie all of that mm-hmm. to Donald Trump, and now if if we see the same thing right. happening with with Biden, oh, we, you know, they're going to tie that right. to Biden then. Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the left and Antifa and all the crap we saw going on, and people were getting paid and all nine yards, and now it's slowed up, and now they got now they got you know they, now it's coming to fruition with it with this you know. They got rid of the Blake thing, right? What, what, what was that, that shooting, right? What's his yeah, name? Jacob, Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake, yeah. That's, yeah, I mean, where, yeah that's, you know, that's where this whole case started from. That's, that's how. Yeah, I, exactly. That that one just that one's gone, and they don't, they, you know, apologize or whatever. I don't know, whatever. But I'm sure there was a knock and notice. You know what? He, he, he knew he knew he knew what he was doing in there. You know, so it just tells me anybody anybody knocking his door was going to get shot. So that's a crime in itself. But yeah. they, 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 they let that go, so it'll be interesting on this. But they're gonna yeah, they, they, gonna... yeah, the whole Jacob Blake thing, I mean, they, they covered all of that up about what, what really happened, what triggered the, the, the cops to even talk mm-hmm. with him to get him shot, all of this crazy stuff. There's a lot of cra- crazy stuff there, and it's just, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's just they, there's, there's, there's a very powerful structure that wants mobs that wants the cops gone that wants to take away our uh-huh. guns, that wants to put people uh-huh. against each each other and just create this mob mentality this chaos that that we're yeah. seeing here. And, and we see it you know we see the whole chaos you look at our government it's complete chaos and it's well you, yeah i mean go go back go back br- briefly to talking about Kyle you get, Kyle gets to say Kyle gets recruited off his social social media and they get a little bus ride to Kenosha and then all of a sudden everybody kind of leaves them hanging. You know, they knew, knew probably knew it was going to happen. I'm just saying it's not, it doesn't take rocket scientists. If you're a white guy standing there with, you know, with an AR-15 in the middle of a bunch of skateboarders and, you know, millennium generation or whatever, they're going to, you know, you're going to get attacked. And so now he starts to defend himself. You know, matter what he does, he's going to shoot his gun. Oh, there's 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 your gun laws. I mean, you you you're right on point, and you know it's it, it's you know this probably happens a lot more than than we saw, you know. But he's getting hung for it because he yeah, I believe because he was not from that state. Yeah, and there was a curfew during that time too. So it, if if there's a curfew. The police aren't enforcing that. Now, I, I mean, again, I don't want to blame the, the cops because what, what it sounds like is that they were told to basically stand down right. from a lot of this stuff. And we're seeing that yeah. in the last three, four years. Uh, we're seeing that more than I've ever seen it here. It, every, they're all told to stand down. They're worried about getting yeah. sued. They don't want to lose their job. You know, They have payments. They have house payments. They have children. They have wives. They're not going to, you know, stand up in, in a very general way uh, because oh, of so it's, what's going to it's, happen. No, it, it, it's, I'm sorry, I interrupt you. That's okay. Um, 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 you're so you're so right because I started in 80, 1981, mm-hmm. and you know we we'd go we'd be working in the neighborhood. We'd, we'd park a patrol car around the corner and go take a walk around neighborhoods and go up and you know shake somebody down. Hey Joe, how you doing, man? Whatever, and they, and they were used to that. And you know they, they weren't holding. If they were holding, we might cut them loose. Or, but it was you know the old days. Or 
we had, we had more contact. Um, you know, we looked for we looked for things. You know, we looked at tow over rocks. We drove around at night with our spotlights on, looking for that burglar, or that that peeping tom. You know, now you now you don't. We were proactive, and now you you're not you're not proactive. Now you just wait for the for the radio call because you go out there first. If you start doing that, you put yourself in a position of liability. They they, they tell them now because no one called the cops, and now it's harassment. It's a race card or whatever because you saw this guy, this color in this neighborhood at this time at night. All of a sudden, it's a, I don't care who you are at 2 in the morning in any neighborhood. You know what I mean? But now they're going to play that off because if it is, a, if it is that, that race car fits that mold. So you can't do that anymore. So these guys are running around. Catch me if you can. You know, and then they catch them. Now they've got, got cell phone cameras on you when you catch them. You know, it's a tough job now, really. Yeah. That's how it was. No, that's crazy. Uh, the whole it thing. is. No, it's the way yeah, they, yeah they, don't, they, they don't they don't respond until somebody's bleeding. You know, that's just the way it is. You know? Right. So, I mean, changing the reform, because a lot of people think, oh, cops are just out there, you know, like wild cowboys. It's like, no, they're actually, you know, if, if, if we are going to make changes into the way that cops act to what they can and can't do, I think a lot of people would say, well, we need to restrict what they do I feel like that's already that's where we are now we need to actually give them more room more 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 leeway to actually do their job um, and to help people so that they don't have to worry about being sued and they don't have to have to worry about all of these issues and there's always going to be bad cops out there you know um, my view is we need more cops. The more cops that you have out there, the more chance you have for good cops to be out there who can look and, and can point out those bad cops. But I do believe a lot of this starts at the highest highest spots um, of our law enforcement, and it's a disconnect between the average everyday common cop and the people who are running this this show and then you have the city mayors, you have all of these other people who have nothing to do with law enforcement, but yet are passing laws on law enforcement. I just feel like the cops have been handcuffed, whereas um, you know, I, I think we need to loosen those chains. And I'm sure a lot of people out there that might listen to this would, are on the complete other side of that. But that's how I, how I feel. They need more room, not less. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the big thing too is is um, that goes along with this. We're talking about the the bail hearing with Kyle is that uh, a lot of states are getting rid of uh, bail bail bondsmen, and, and you know, the bail bondsman does not cost the taxpayer any money. But yet, when you're a bail bondsman, you're bailing out Joe Blow that just you know robbed you know some liquor store, but he he had enough money to post a million dollar bond, and he has a right to. And, uh, you know, now the bondsman has, maybe he has the liquor store's collateral, but you're keeping an eye on this guy. He's a, he's a menace to society. He carries a gun. And now law enforcement doesn't have to keep an eye on this guy. Hmm. That loosens law enforcement up at several levels that people don't realize that you have the, the greatest business in the world, the crime business, is being a bail bondsman because it costs the taxpayers nothing. It's, it's, it's built on private enterprise. The guy that works or owns a business. He pays your your bail for that, the ten percent. You make a good living, and those are the watchdogs of law enforcement. We did a lot of things over the years to help law enforcement get some really bad guys or bail. And sometimes we wouldn't bail out a bad guy if law enforcement asked us not to, and we've, we've done that before. I don't care how much it was, and you know what? Because we just would say we didn't because we knew that this guy would go out and he's going to shoot two more people or mm-hmm. something like that, you know. And so it goes both ways, but. Then, yeah, law enforcement, their hands are tied in so many ways, absolutely. You know, and, and with the camera thing, is just the cameras have changed. Cameras will change law enforcement. You know, that after, the, after the, you know, Bank of America, Hollywood, the shootout, the cameras and this next thing, it changed everything forever. And it, it is tough, you know what I mean? And the DAs, you know, it's funny you, get, it's funny you get all this evidence now, and the DAs aren't, you know, aside, aside from COVID, you're not seeing people you know, doing time for, you know, some pretty bad stuff, you know, and they still, they still got the drug wars, you know, so if you get, you know, still got three strikes uh, on some stuff, it seems like with with crack cocaine and things like that. 
you know. So how does how does this work with the whole bonds the whole bondsman thing? I guess I, I really also wanted to understand um, the re- okay. So you already said the bondsmen they're pretty much private. They're private. Are, are they contracted by the city? Uh, how does how does this whole process work to where um, and then how do, how do they know? Okay, we got this guy on 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 bail. We're gonna go go after him. How does this whole process work? Um, okay, the, okay. Bail bondsmen are licensed by the Department of Insurance in that state. So we're, we're insurance agents, just like all state insurance agent would be. We're licensed by the DOI Department of Insurance, and you have to get a license. So you do is you get a, a bail bonds license, and they got an agent's license, and they got a lower one, so which is like a solicitor's license. And um, the bail agent license allow you to open your bail, own bail bond company. And those bail bonds um, are surety bail bonds, like like with some mechanic mechanics bond or any kind of bond. And they're a ten percent bond, and the surety companies are private. And these are, these are filed with the Department of Insurance, State of California, in the bonding division. So every bond that you write in the State of California or anywhere else with that state is registered with the State of California. Hmm. So. You're licensed like that, and you got to go through. And as a bondsman, you also have to, as owning a company, you have to put up X amount of collateral for yourself to give to own a house. So in case you write a bond, you can't get the guy. They could take your house. It goes into that. And then what happens is, is that you start advertising back then, yellow pages and such, and um, people call you um, and they look at they, they look you up in advertising, and then you post the bond. Interesting. Then what are the liability like? If I'm a bondsman, what do I need to worry about um, as far as overstepping the bound? Because that's pretty. That's a pretty dangerous thing. You would think the cops would be out there searching for these people, but if you have bondsmen out there who aren't cops, it's kind of um, that puts them in a pretty tough spot. I would say. Oh, who's who in a tough spot? The bondsman? Yeah, yeah. The the bondsman to actually oh. get there, to to do their job sure. without doing something violent or, you know. Oh, no, it's, over, it's, that, that's what that, you know, that's why, you know, um, like with the bounty, so, so the bounty hunters, the, the, bail, the bail enforcement officers or agents, you can call with the bounty hunters, um, that's like, you know, what, what I did and a lot of guys did. I did my own bounty hunting for my company and for, for several other companies. Mm-hmm. But is that, um, you know, um, Bill Papenhausen, and the guy I worked with down here as a PI, he went into the bail bond business years ago when I was down here, and he posted uh, a, um, a five million dollar bond when he was getting getting out a few years ago. That's five hundred thousand dollars in his pocket, but they had to put up collateral. So to keep this guy from running, people put up property or or whatever's worth X amount of money, and that tries to keep him honest. But people do skip on their parents' homes when the a family put a house or a vacation house up. You know, I've seen that too. They don't care. They'll run. And then that money is used to go ahead and pay your your bounty hunters or you got to fly to Oklahoma or something. That money in the collateral, uh, you can cash that in, parts of it, or if it's cash collateral to use to hunt down that fugitive bail jumper. So that's how you protect yourself so you don't go under as you use the collateral as the expenses for that uh, bounty uh, hunt. Okay. So the the bail bondsman. Mm-hmm. Trying, now I'm trying to understand. The, this is all new to me. I don't know anything about this. Stuff. Sure. The bail, the bail bondsman and the bounty hunter. The relationship is uh, the bounty hunter works for the bail bondsman, or how does I'm trying to understand that relationship. I guess. Well, okay. you're right. The, um, in mo- most states now, you have to be licensed as a as a fugitive or bail recovery agent or bounty hunter. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were the first ones. As a matter of fact, I, pa- I had those laws passed in California. Um, back in 1998, I think was when we got them passed, AB 243, because there was felons that could do it. Uh, you, bail agents are licensed, basically. The bounty hunters are now licensed, but they weren't. And so the bounty hunters go, uh, and they're hired by a bail agency, and they're a subcontractor, and they give them the paperwork, and they usually get 10% of the uh, bail am- or the bond amount. So uh, if it's a $50,000 bond, uh, they would get five grand to, to find this guy, hunt him down, catch him, and bring him, you know, to, to jail. And so that's how that works. So you, the bounty hunters are independent from the bail agent, but there's some that work, and there's some bail agents do, do it themselves. So that's how that works. Okay. Very interesting. Uh-huh. 
Um, all right, so let's go about maybe 15, 20, 20 more minutes here on this, and then we'll kind of wrap this one up here. But sure. um, um, uh, by now, um, you know, people who are listening to this podcast, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, I'm going to uh, probably play a lot of this bond court hearing for the people first, put our stuff, what, what we're talking about, add that in second, and just kind of break it all down there. Um, but we've kind of gone through what the hearing, what they uh, what they were looking at here. Mr. Binger, uh, what specifically triggered this? Because uh, here's the other thing that I, I want to understand. So, okay, the bond is set at $2 million. Now they want to increase it to... Two million two hundred thousand. So, does what happens to the two million dollar bond? And because it's already been paid, that's the other thing. So he he's already posted bail on that, right? He's already covered whatever it was for the two million. Um, does he have to do that now that they're going to raise it an extra two hundred thousand? Does the process start all over again, or does he just need to come up with? 10% of the 200,000 or I'm trying to understand how that works. Too. Oh, well, okay. This, this was, a, this was, a, this was a cat and they're, they're saying bonds, so, but they already have a cash bond up for the 2 million. So I'm guessing it's another 200,000. If it's another 200,000, what the court will do is they'll go ahead and they, I guess they can add that on. Or if they got to post a new bond, if it is a new court bond, what they'll do is they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll set aside, they'll vacate, set aside and exonerate the first bond and then they'll have a the second bond issued for two point two million dollars. Okay, okay. So that's that's one way I think they might do it because uh, otherwise it, it'd be looking at it if you were stacking charges, <laughs> adding more charges. Right. Okay. Then you would add, add then you would add a second bond. So. Okay. So when they say they want to increase the bond by two by two hundred thousand, um, that means they want him to pay an extra. Two hundred thousand, or a, a percentage of the two hundred thousand. I, I was a little confused on that part too. Well, you know what? They, yeah, you know they're saying bond, so you're right. I'm confused a little too. Is that if it's a surety bond, that means that the two hundred thousand technically would be twenty grand, or is it two million dollar bond? It would be two hundred thousand. It was a surety bond, so it's telling me it's still a cash request for a cash bond to be added. They want two hundred thousand added right. uh, to the okay. bond. That That's what it sense. sounds like. And yeah. then they want a new warrant. Is is that is that just standard? Is that just how it is? If 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 I raise the the bond, if the judge raises the bond by two hundred thousand, do they have to issue another warrant? No, they no, they don't. No, they don't have to because the warrant the warrant would be based on failure to appear, or failure to pay. Right, the saying he failed to appear, but made all his other court appearances, he had good cause to. Um, not appear because he's a fear for his life and that he did appear with his attorney again. Correct. No, there's no judge that's going to issue a warrant. That's just a, in other words, if, if it was technically he didn't appear and said F you, the judge would issue a warrant. He'd, he'd go ahead and revoke the bond. So the bond's revoked. Okay. And here, here's, you have now have a warrant issued. And so now you got the bondsman, everybody looking for, you get, you, you know, you get a forfeiture in the mail as a bondsman. Basically that's the same as, the court issuing a warrant. So now right. you know the guy's on the run or something. And that that's not how it would, would work on that. Now, there's no, there's no reason to issue a warrant. Okay. So, yeah, that's why it just seems like they're just really over overstepping here. Mm -hmm. um, right. And that's, I mean, it just seems like such a coordinated thing here. Um, you know, with this, this case, the whole thing is just, they're just they want to... They want the people, just the regular average everyday people, to already think that Kyle Rittenhouse is guilty, that he's jumping bond because he's guilty. All of these things that we're we're finding out are not true. And so I just hope the people that th – I want to thank everybody who has taken the time to actually listen to this because you can you could see. If you just look at the facts, just look at what they're saying here, look at what the judge is saying, what everybody's saying here, you know, you don't, you don't need um, – it does take 55 minutes of your time, but if you take those 55 minutes to watch this court hearing, you can you can get a very clear case of all different sides. Turn off CNN, turn off news media, especially with the, with these types of of cases. You just you're better off. I mean, nothing wrong with 
looking at all that stuff afterwards, but I think if you look at it first, if you read all of these blog posts first, all of these hit pieces first, you know, you're going to you're already starting with something that's really really bad, then you have to kind of take all peel the the bad skin off of this good fruit to really get to what the truth is here. So, just start with with the good fruit, I think. You know, I, I'm I'm looking forward to this case. I'm really sad that it's going to be till no November. That's a long, long time, mm-hmm. long time. That's uh, that's very disturbing here. That's going to take that long. But um, so the judge asks what triggered it. The Mr. Binger says what triggered it. The court mailed a notice to the defendant on December 22nd indicating that there was an uh, arraignment on this case on January 5th that was sent to his old address, um, and uh, which was the address on record for Kyle Rittenhouse. Now, even though the court sent this document to... Kyle to a place that Kyle Rittenhouse did not actually live at, Kyle Rittenhouse did show up to court on January 5th. So that's a big deal because um, the judge makes that very, very clear that, you know, he still showed up. He still showed up for everything. He's never missed any court dates. He's always been on on time. He's done everything that the court has has told him to. And so... You know, it just seems like um, the DA is really, really reaching. I think that they realize that they really, really messed up by even charging him. And now they're at that point where they can't just say, oh, sorry, we charged you and we shouldn't have. This kid either has – they not saying that the DA, but these this evil power structure has to either take Kyle Rittenhouse out so that he can't make that court date. Or um, they just have to keep doing these little things to try to, you know, get people to think that Kyle Rittenhouse is doing all of these bad things, but because he's white and because we have a white judge, that they got him off. And so I think we're going to see the second one. I don't, you know, I've, I'm really disturbed by the fact of that people could know where Kyle Rittenhouse lives, and from the very, very start way back when, when Kyle Rittenhouse did live at that place, um, that people could have, have found him. Even this lawyer, Mr. Binger, um, makes that very, very clear, is that the person who lives there now could be in danger, but he doesn't recognize the fact that Kyle Rittenhouse was in danger. So it's it, it's just some very, very weird logic. And, and that does suck that these <laughs> lawyers don't have to be honest that there's no consequences for them lying here. You know, but yet if Kyle Rittenhouse lies, if he does anything wrong, then he's he's guilty, you know. Even if he says one wrong thing, they're just going to say, "Okay, well that's well, that he's guilty." Well, you know, that that's that's a DA for you. You know, he he, he him him, you know, back, backpedaling to say, "Oh, well, if Kyle doesn't give up his new address, it's going to put and jeopardize the people at his former address." And it's like, well, what about this? You know what? When you go for a new address, they ask for a former address. And even if you don't, they can link it. So it does link it back there even more gravely to the former address, Mr. DA. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. And that's what it does. So if they do get a listed address or get addressed, they get it to the listing, it will affect the prior address more so than it does without it. It's just yeah. it's added, It adds to the fire. And that's the logic they have, Greg. Is that you know, and the, and the thing is, is that what with, with the, the, the risking Kyle's life and his family's life and friends, they go don't don't. This is something don't go as far as friends. The guys used to hang out with him a couple of years ago at the burger joint, and maybe harass him. Anything they could find, and um, uh, who, and who knows what else, anybody else knows, but they're gonna do that. Um, so you know, this kid he has to hide out. I mean, there's no there's no way he can't hide out. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's pretty much. I mean, it. come on, <laughs> that's, that's it. If you watch, I mean, this, that's it. 
if you watch the actual video, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, the the lawyer, his lawyer is basically shaking his head during this whole 55 minutes. Like, what am I, I know. doing here? Why are we even here talking about this stuff? And, oh uh, yeah. You know, he makes some of the some of the best points um, during this this whole thing. But it's like, okay, Mr. Binger. Who rep, who is a lawyer for the DA is basically saying we need to know where he is. We need you know we're sending him documents and it's like okay you know but it's that sending him documents and because it kicks back and comes back to the clerk saying the person does not actually live there. Blah blah. You know what? Is that the only communication that you're having? No. With him? No. No. no the attorney. Attorney. God. Attorneys, attorneys, uh, there's lots of attorneys that use um, mainly to, their mail office address for their clients. Man, you know what? The attorney will get the message to them. Just, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's like they're playing like in some little kid sandbox. You know, I mean, but but I mean, the, the bottom line is is that the court can seal uh, in, in any kind of any kind of documents, address, whatever, that, that, for a compelling need for secrecy. Which That's is what it. Done. Thank, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, I mean, you know, the, the judges. He, and then the, I love when the DA would start talking about kind of, kind of, you know, oh, overshadowing the, a threat. A threat of oh, there might be the, 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 the protest might happen or whatever. You know, like, right. the judge didn't didn't like that either. Let's, let's not start bringing that into the courtroom. Right. Know? Right. He's like, yeah, that's, that's not going to rule. That's not going to yeah. decide how how I rule. And of course, on that same day, on the same day as this um, took took place, there were some protesters outside that were asking that this judge be taken off of this case. Really? And it's all by yeah, and and it's all bias. It's all because he did not put Kyle Rittenhouse back in jail. That's what they want. Yeah. They want to get him in yeah. jail. It'll be a lot easier for them to hire somebody who's already in jail to kill this, mm-hmm. this kid. Oh yeah. So they're going to sure. kill him in jail, or they're going to find out yeah. where he lives between now and no November, and they're going to try to kill him there. What is good is that now that it's sealed up. Only certain people will know where he actually lives. So if something does happen to him, you'll have a pretty good idea of how that information got out. So that is a good thing. Sure. Oh yeah, and I, I think I think I think the state owes Kyle Rittenhouse protection. I, they should sign, you know, basically twenty four twenty four seven one trooper or something in the area, because you know what? Um, it goes back to like you talking about. This might have been a setup, and it went from you know. The recruitment and there's a lot of people in Antifa and everything else that know a lot of things. You know, mm-hmm. this kid here might be, might know some things or or whatever thinks. You know, it, it might have been a setup and they they want him out of the way. It's it's going to be hard for him to become a cop at this point, isn't it, Kyle Rittenhouse? Yeah, it's kind of like Richard Jewell with the Oklahoma City or the Oklahoma Atlanta City bombings. Um, you know, I think I think somebody finally hired him, but you know what? It, it's just it's the you know what? It's 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 not that it was good or bad. It's the it's the publicity. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if the kid, kid, you know, if he was Audie Murphy nowadays, he might have a hot problem getting a cop job because he killed too many Germans or whatever. You know. You know, he I might mean, have a good lawsuit. Kyle Rittenhouse might have a good lawsuit against this um, against these people actually because they've ruined his life. Don't you think? Yeah, I mean, in the defense to that, as a kid with nowadays, with 17 years old, you know that as soon as you pull the trigger in public, you're on, you know, you know, 11 o'clock news. You know, right. I, right. you know, so I mean, that's the that might be light light on the defense, but you know, I mean, that, who knows? I mean, publicity is that is that a reason to do this? Yes, for some people, sure, not for this kid. You know, otherwise he would have had a GoPro on his helmet, right? Right. So I mean, that's, that's how I look at it. Um, you know, yeah, but you know, um, I don't know. I mean, it's nowadays. I mean, he, he, you know what? At least somebody hires him for something. You know, I don't, the kids. I don't think the kids nuts. You know, and if he's not nuts, I think he's fine. You know, I think time time will time will time will go by. You know. Um, and, and it's, up, it's an uphill climb. I hope he does well with it. You know, he didn't do anything different than a lot of people would have done and wanted to do. 
Right. You know, right. well, even I would have. I mean, I put myself in his shoes a couple different times, saying, "Yeah, if I was close and something happened, I was gung ho at that age." And you know, and I know. I tell you what, if it was at my my era in the seventies, there'd been a lot more guys with me if I was Kyle, because that was that's how we rolled. You know, it would, you know. Now you got too many snowflakes out there. He, you know, so he, he sticks his nose out a little bit and tries to do something he felt was right. And a lot of people will tell you it's right. And it maybe, maybe won't tell you it's right. That he's, he, he's, he did what anybody else was thinking, you know? Right. And, you know, and, and they didn't do it. So, but all the other guys, like, you know, hopped up on dope and meth and they get paid 15 or 25 bucks an hour to be out there raising hell and burning businesses down and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, you know, the, you know, there's those people, the ones that should be on the on the news every day, being with their sentencing and convictions. Let the public see that part. You know? Right. They should be in jail because if people see see that, yeah. then, then yeah. they won't actually go out there. Because if you look at the video for a lot of the riots, there are a lot of people just standing around watching, filming, doing nothing. But <laughs> if if right. people know that, hey, by by you being there. You're going to go to jail. Those people aren't going to show up. And every time that the the cops can actually do their job and do that, that's when those people leave. But it, they they never get to. And I, I used to see this all the time at Jack uh, Jack London Square. We used to see this. Right? It'd be just this huge group gathering, the cops would let them riot, they'd let them do all this. Once it got too too crazy, then the cops would step in. But that's after right. hours and hours and hours. And of course, you know, once the cops actually were able to do their job and get rid of the actual riots, it was over within minutes. It does it right. doesn't take much. So it's just like it's being used and even these kids that show up for these riots, for these quote unquote protests they don't realize what they're actually doing there. They are sheep. They are being used as as sheep for uh, a bad purpose. Right. These aren't good sheep. Right. These are these are bad sheep. And that's yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's just true. You know, I mean, I mean, I I look at it. And it's different from from like when we grew up during the Vietnam War. You know, I mean, I was I was nine years old in '68. You know, I remember watching stuff on TV. I remember it like yesterday and. You know what? It was it was a group of people, and the colleges were close by in the Bay Area, and things were happening. It was pretty bad, but you know it wasn't. You know it wasn't like they were following, you know, an, the, 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 an agenda like they're following now. You know, was it, was it um, speaking of that? Was it uh, like a Democrat, or Republican? Was there that? Oh, divide, it was, or was it just everybody who just realized? Oh no, it was it was it was it was it was it was, it was, it was, it was nonpartisan, man. It was everybody. Everybody. But there's a lot of Republican kids that would be Republicans. You'd say that were against the war. We're out there too. Oh wow. You know, uh, yeah, there, there was more than you'd think. You know, because it was nothing was the right thing to do or peer pressure, but it was just the right thing to do. I mean. I mean, there was the time that a lot of guys came back and protested that were in in the war, protested against the war. That was the first time you saw that, you know. So when you're watching that as a kid, um, is the news slanted? Is it slanted? Is it you know? Are they encouraging you know people to stand up to show that the war is wrong? Are they doing their job as journalists, being non non biased? Uh, what is your experience with that? I mean, or, or did they just? show you whatever is happening there and to kind of leave their own thoughts out of it. Oh, well, we, like we, we used to watch Cronkite and Reasoner and, um, you know, they, no, they were, they were, they, they were, they, I mean, they told the truth as much as they could, Yeah. you know, but those guys were writing their own stuff. But I mean, Cronkite, Con, Walter Cronkite came out when he, he basically said, we we're going to lose the war. I mean, there's that now the, that never would have even made the airways. You know, right. I mean, he said that it's like, and I don't remember seeing that specifically, you know, but I remember him being on and all that, but I remember seeing it, you know, at the time, but it's, you know, they, they come out and say, we're going to lose the war. It's like, who's, man, we're Americans, man. We don't do that. And, um, and that was, that was, and that, he was, that was a consensus of Americans. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, my mom, everybody, you know, anybody, I mean, parents, there, was, there wasn't a bunch of gung-ho people around my parents in the 70s or 60s that were for the war. Nobody was for that thing. That was the worst thing ever. Was there anybody that you remember that was pro-war during that time? You know what? I'll be honest with you, nobody. 
Nobody. Yeah. I swear to God. Yeah. I mean, my dad served in Korea. He was in reserve in, in the Navy, but you know, um, that, then you know, didn't hear much about that, of course. But um, uh, no, I don't know anybody that in, in growing up in you know San Mateo or going to San Francisco. There, that was for not any nobody that I could see. You know. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious about that. I'm always fascinated by, you know, the war back back then and how it how it was in how the people, you know, I talked to my dad about this this stuff too, and you know, it's just it's just always fascinating to get people's views on it, people who were actually going through it um, during that that time. I mean, obviously, it's easy to see now that it, that it was wrong, it was bad, but I mean, um, it's. It's good to hear that it was not about party party lines. All the Republicans were in were in favor. They wanted the war, and the Democrats didn't. Type of thing. Uh, That's good. I mean, it, it it brought it brought down more political careers than any time ever. I mean, people under Nixon and under Nixon, everybody. But I mean, like my like my grandfather and my 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 mother was born in San Francisco. But my grandfather during the Second World War would, would go down once a month or so and pick up soldiers coming into. Uh, San Francisco and take them over, bring them home for dinner. And during Vietnam, my parents, we'd go down to SFO and um, there'd be, usually there was a family or something like that that met them there from like another state. And then we'd, we'd bring them to our house for dinner uh, when they came back from Vietnam. And, well, and yeah, they would, that's, that's a yeah. great question. What, what was the feeling like towards, towards soldiers? Was it the whole Jane Fonda, I'm going to spit on soldiers thing, or how was? Uh... Oh no, no, we didn't see that. I mean, we, we had, we had, I mean, we had, we had soldiers come to our house for dinner, and, and their sister would play guitar and kumbaya, and it was fun. And no, we didn't see that. I mean, you know, in the city I grew up in, San Mateo, it's across from you where you're at, you know, mm -hmm. but. Um, no, we, I didn't see any of that stuff. I mean, there were some riots and things like CSM and in Berkeley, I'm sure, and in Stanford. I mean, you know, stuff like that, but not really. I mean, I think it's just, I, I don't know. We just kind of lived our lives. We were out in the street playing catch and playing sports, and, you know, it was on TV, but, you know, but I think, you know, everybody knew somebody's brother or somebody who was serving over there in Vietnam. I mean, every, everybody, every so many blocks, you know, they were a couple of years older than I was. So there was total respect. And as far as the soldiers, how were they? Do you, I mean, were they uh, talkative? Were they more reserved? Or what was the? How did I? I'm always curious about how the soldiers. Because I knew a couple of people that I went to school with. They go to war. They come back, and they are completely different people. Their mentality is different. The way that they talk, um, everything is a lot more serious, you know. So I'm just curious about how were the soldiers that that were there that that you uh, spoke with? They just oh, you know what? So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm like you know, ten, eleven years old, whatever. Right. Cool. And so these guys are like nineteen or twenty, and you wouldn't, you know what? It wasn't like they, like Elias from Platoon. I mean, these guys looked good. They they looked healthy. And they were in country. They were first airborne, or 82nd airborne, sorry. Mm -hmm. And, um, you no, know, because they stayed the night. I mean, we got to know them. And it, what, I think that what, what, you, what you saw and I saw, and I saw years later, because I worked with veterans in the police department, even seeing them now from Vietnam War, the, my war, is that uh, um, they, they change. I think that they get, they get more salty. Things, you know, when they first come back, I think they're just, they're just happy they're back. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a whole, it's, yeah, the guy's not in the corner telling you how he shot up, you know, 27 guys yesterday and just flew in from Da Nang, and, you know, it wasn't not, nothing like that. I think, you know, but they weren't, you know, and it, was it quiet? No, I mean, it, it was, it was well, pretty much the same, man. It was, a, it was like a nice family party atmosphere, like you'd be camping out, you know, it was really cool. Oh, good, good. Yeah, that, that part, but I understand what you're saying, though. I didn't, I've met guys like that, too, though. Yeah, it's just always nice to hear that they're just happy to be to be home or happy to be back and just kind of you know just in a in a good mood. I guess you know I I think that's that was the other thing. Some of the soldiers that I spoke with, it's just like man, they're just glad to be home. <laughs> that was the big. That's the biggest takeaway I got from it. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, he, I mean, these guys, you know, they flew into SFO. I, I think they went from wherever case, I don't know, case or wherever they flew into Tokyo. And then from there, they flew right to SFO, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And they're getting them. They were just, they were just in country 13 hours, 14 hours earlier, man. Wow. You know, I mean, that was a tough, that's a tough deal. They just, that means, you know, they, they, they just happy to be home. Yeah. Yeah, and I only bring all, all that up is because, you know, maybe uh, I kind of feel like either Kyle, Kyle Rittenhouse is going to try to join law in mm-hmm. enforcement or maybe he's going to become a soldier. So it's very, you know, curious to see what, yeah. what happens with with, with him uh, going going forward now that his life is basically ruined and he's going to have to worry about, you know, crazy people trying to kill him for the rest of, sure. his, of his life. That's just, that's the truth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, poor, I feel bad for the kid, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's all. I mean, it's. You know, this is going to make other people that might want to help. This is going to make them think twice. I mean, I, I think this is why a lot of people are just like, I don't want to get involved. You know, they don't right. want to talk about it. They don't want to think yeah. about it. They just, you know, don't want to get involved because they don't. It's just, it's not worth the, the sacrifice. So, oh, sure. It's like it's like that couple that they um they were protecting their house, uh, and they had the weapons out front in the front yard. I think he was an attorney or something, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and people said what they're gonna do to his wife and kids and kill him. And uh, you know, as soon as you pull a gun, it's like you, you're, you're like you're, the Antichrist you're or something, man. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's like why you know what you was you know. I, I I don't know about you, but man, the last thing I want to do is go fight five guys with clubs and skateboards with my fist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, you know, it's it's it's, it's a Sicilian way. You know, they bring a knife, they bring a gun. You know, you're not going to sit there and spill blood with each. You know, this, if somebody makes that kind of overt act, and, and 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 you know, the thing is, people, you got as a law, as a police officer and stuff. When you look at it in a situation like this, is that you know, Kyle tried to get away from the threat. He ran. Right. Okay. That's huge. If he just stood up there like you know Eastwood or Rambo. You know, he might say this kid. You know, he'd be looking at what where was he? You know, been shooting down at, you know, front sight. You know, with the FBI or something. But this kid, you know, he he took off running. Right. I mean, wow. And then he went to the ground, and the guys are hitting him. He just kind of, you know, I I I I take I take ten people in that same situation, and there's I mean, be two, not maybe not even three, two, but they'll do what he would have done. You know, how many people would have just cowered down and got beat. They would have just they would have, they wouldn't have shot. They would it, trust me. You'd be surprised. They would have just cowered down and, and took it. That's sad. That's sad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's that, that's the other thing that they never really bring up is that Kyle shot shot two of these people while he was on the ground. Well, the the yes. first person that yeah. he shot, he only shot him because he was backed into a to a corner. Uh-huh. He had nowhere to right. go. Right. Right. Exactly. Person. That's that's it. I mean, all of that, and that's sure. in these in these court documents too. It's all there. Oh, I know. Documents. When he had, when he, you know, when he had a chance to flee, it's it's you know, it's flight or it's 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 you know, a fight or flight syndrome, you know. Mm-hmm. And he fought when he had to, when he when he could fly, and he could get away from the threat. You know, he, he got away from the threat. You know. And then shows he he's not a train. He's not, yeah. He he, he mm-hmm. tried to turn himself in and. As you as you said, you know he he spoke to a cop there, and they just drove off. Mm-hmm. And so, why are they charging yeah. him with fleeing the scene? He exactly. It it doesn't make any sense. He's the, he's the first person that called anybody, told them, "Hey, I I just shot this this person." He was there. He didn't flee. Even after he shot that first person, he did not flee. He stayed there to try to help that person. It was only after somebody said. Just leave, you know. It's 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 time because there were more people circling. They were watching him, you know. Oh, he just killed someone. Get him, get him, get him. I mean, if you listen to the videos, you know, you can you can hear these people clearly saying, "Get him." They're coming after mm-hmm. him. Yeah. You need to ask himself, what would you do in that spot too before you just? Well, here's, here's, yeah. Here's what I asked with the the burger, that DA burger. Mm-hmm. Is who's above him pulling those 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 strings there? Right. You know, what, what, is this is this a happenstance scenario? Where we got this, you know, seventeen year old white kid with a gun shooting everybody up. Oh, we, now we can let's see, we can use this. Or is was this plan, 
or and or now that we either way it's planned or not, who's who's now making the moves? What are they going to use it for? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's not every day you get footage like that of a guy shooting somebody. You know, unless it's the cops, because most guys who shoot people don't wear cameras, right? Right. So you know, you know, this is pretty rare footage. So what's the agenda above this? Uh, for for who and for what in, in the in the state in the state you know or, or what have you or bit, of course larger than that of course yeah yeah it's definitely that, that the that the, the DA was just fight he was just fighting for something that was it was ridiculous how long it took to, with the, you know the he knew the outcome would be right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah he makes that very <laughs> very clear it's just like you know you you listen to him and you're like really do you really believe what what you're saying I it's really hard. But, um, yeah, he just wants to make sure that, you know, that we know where this person is in case he tries to jump bail. Mm-hmm. So he's, you know, right. he wants to make, he wants to know where Kyle Rittenhouse is in case he does try to jump bail. So he's already thinking that Kyle Rittenhouse is going to jump bail. I don't know if that's the best way. I don't know if other DA's offices, I don't know how they all work, but, I mean, man, I mean, as this judge says, this happens. People jump bail, and they go, and they, they have people to find them if they jump bail. This DA, the lawyer for the DA, is not going to go find them. So why does he need to know where this, this kid is? That's going to help this, this DA's case. If, if Kyle jumps bail, runs, it's going to help his case because it's going to make Kyle Rittenhouse look guilty. So that's why I think they were tr- – that's what they right. were trying to right. do. Many right. of these news re- reports were making it seem like he had jumped bail. So that way people will subconsciously think, oh, well, yeah, he jumped bail. Guilty. But that's not what happened. It was a te- – Right, yeah. It was a technicality. It was a minor thing. As this judge said, yes, Kyle Rittenhouse should have told – you know, he should have wrote where he actually lived. My view personally is that – his uh, uh, lawyer, as you pointed out, because he's 17, he's going to do what the the lawyer and his parents tell him. That's why I think right around this time, his he fires the lawyer. Because right after this whole thing came out about Kyle Rittenhouse jumping bail, they can't find him, blah, 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 he fires the lawyer. So the connection of that timing does make me think that somebody told Kyle Rittenhouse, just put your old property, just put where you used to live on this document, which means maybe it's even bigger. You know, we really don't know. There's a lot of other questions, but really um, what this comes down to is the actual court case, and I really hope that this show will help people try to stay focused as we go forward here. We've given you everything. So when the trial does come up in seven months from from now, please make sure focus on the case. Focus on what is said in that case. Focus on the facts. Focus on the actual documents. And then come to your own conclusion about what you think if Kyle Rittenhouse, if what he did was right, if what he did was wrong, put yourself in his shoe and think about what you would do in that spot. And that's what I hope to uh, to accomplish from this show here. We'll see. We will see. But the judge, Judge Schroeder, we know that he was not impressed. And um, uh, he basically said that, uh, you know, um, Mr. Binger, no, we're not going to raise Kyle Rittenhouse's bond. Um, he's not going to put out a warrant. A lot of people were very uh, upset. And if you watch the video, you'll see John Huber's father, who is um, on this 50-minute uh, uh, video, he flips off the camera. And we don't know if he was flipping off the judge, flipping off Kyle Rittenhouse. As the judge is explaining why he's saying we're not going to... Um, change his bond we're not going to put Kyle Rittenhouse in jail for another seven months blah 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 John Huber's father um you can see um let me make sure if it's John Huber yeah so the uh, father um he's he's writing something down and you can't really tell what he's putting up but he he writes something on paper and he puts it up on the screen I can't see exactly what he put up there, but I hope it's not a threat. I hope it's not veiled threats 
towards Kyle. Because um, that's going to be a whole other issue. Because then, at that point, if something does happen to Kyle, Kyle Rittenhouse, I believe that one of the first suspects that I would look at then, not for the, for the murder of Kyle Rittenhouse, if that happens, and I hope that doesn't happen, but John Huber would be a person that I would look at to make sure that he was not involved in this uh, because he clearly has a motive because Kyle Rittenhouse did kill his son, whether you believe it's in self-defense, which I do, or whether you don't, which John Huber does not, obviously. Um, John Huber should never, ever know where Kyle Rittenhouse lives. And um, I just hope that it stays that way. So just kind of wrapping up here, um, I think that was about all I wanted to cover. The Judge Schroeder, you know, I'm really shocked we're going to have to wait another seven months. But um, the, Mr. Binger did want to know where Kyle Rittenhouse lived, and the judge had said no. He said if the sheriff, if the sheriff can keep on top of this as to whether there's a violation, that's where most of your Im information comes from. Then you know. Um, that's basically it. The sheriff's department was in charge of reporting the bond, the violations, and I think the same situation is true here now. And the judge pretty much says that it's that it's over. So, Mr. Binger tries even after the judge says this hearing is over. Uh, Binger tries to say, yeah, but you know, Kyle Rittenhouse isn't in this state, so it's 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 a it's a messy situation. But I do believe um, if if anybody has not seen that video, it's still on YouTube, so make sure that you watch it because it could get taken down at some point. But uh, it seems like all of the hearings so far have been you know public. We've all been able to to watch them, and I look forward to the actual trial here. Um, so, Stephen, any final words on this case before we wrap this up? Oh no, Greg, I think that. Uh people keep an open mind on this and um you, you know like i said i think you know just put the narrative of he you know he lived in the state down the block you know walked down there there was protecting property the recruitment part of that kind of stuff there's a lot of other people that have been recruited for things he just he's the poster child for for whatever cause uh that uh, the left is uh, looking for on this here and that's why this uh, this thing maybe gets strung out and i sure thank you greg for another great podcast all right, my brother. Thank you very much for um, for for joining me here, and I'm going to stop this recording, but hold on the line. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay.